Man, do we have a fun triangulation coming up for you. Leo Laporte here. And in just a moment, I'm going to talk to Mark Richards. He's the author of a beautiful photo history of computing. It's called Core Memory, next on Triangulation. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 393, recorded Monday, March 18th, 2019, for air April 12th, 2019, Core Memory, with Mark Richards. Triangulation is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Hiring is challenging, but there's one place you can go where hiring is simple and smart. That place is ZipRecruiter, where growing businesses connect to qualified candidates. Try it free at ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. And by Captera. Find the right tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Visit Captera's free website at captera.com slash triangulation. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get together with some of the most interesting people in technology. And it's kind of a luxury show for me. I get to spend time with them and talk. And, and uh, I think we're going to have some fun with this one. Now, if you're listening to this Triangulation Stop now, unless you're on an airplane. Uh, keep listening if you're on an airplane, but stop now and get the video version because there's going to be a lot to see today. Our guest today is the author of a new photography book. Mark Richards has just printed Core Memory, a visual survey of vintage computers. And this trip through time for somebody of a certain vintage is gorgeous. Mark, welcome to Triangulation. Well, thank you very much for having me. And credit, by the way, to uh, John Alderman, who wrote uh, a great historical pieces around each thing. Yes, so and um, in the second edition, I also want to give credit to the last um, uh, eight machines. Uh, the text was written by Dag um, oh, good. of Dag uh, Computer History Museum yeah. fame. Yeah. So, tell me, first of all, you're not a, originally a photographer. You're a war correspondent. Well, I... I Wait, good training for I the had, computer history um, museum. <laughs> I had deep insecurities, so as every young male knows, you should go off and try to cover war. And I was a photojournalist, to be perfectly honest. Oh, that's cool. So I, you brought your camera and, uh, well, yeah. and your pen. Um, no, I, you know, my ability to write is somewhere between a fourth and a fourth grader and a fifth grader, but... I can talk well. <laughs> and by the way, what is that? Is that your website? Or is that another book? Because that we just saw uh, the beauty of War is Boring. The oh, beauty uh, that is an uh, interview they did about my uh, um, my my brief time as a war correspondent. Who were you, who are you shooting for? Well, I, I kind of went over there, like I said. Um, I didn't have anybody. I le ended up selling pictures to Time Magazine. But you were, you were stringing at the time. I was just... Stupid at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that qualifies. Yes. And this wasn't our Afghanistan war. This is back when the Russians, oh, the yeah. Ruskies, were still in. That's the that's the old school. Yeah. You know, none of this yeah. new school. It's a shame we didn't learn the lesson that the Russians had learned. You think? Uh, but there you go. Uh, these are. This is obviously it's a Russian. Uh, is it a Russian soldier? Is that Afghani? yes? That's a POW. Oh um, my, oh I my. I wouldn't want to say what happened. I was with the. Um, I was with the. There were seven major groups, and I was with one of them. Um, that and the leader of that was actually um, uh, Masood, who uh, was a, a significant leader within Afghanistan. And he was in a certain from the Panjshir Valley. Not Taliban, but but no, no, yeah, no. This is he was not Taliban. Yeah, yeah this yeah. is way prior to. That's right. The Taliban came in after the Russians Correct. left. That's right. Correct. So, uh, did you had you had training in photography? Were you? Yeah. No. No. I. 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 I I'm going to go backwards quickly and move forwards quickly. Just like this book, chronology is uh, overrated. I, I, I left to join the Navy at 17 because at the time the Vietnam War was going on. and um, You enlisted? I enlisted wow. because the Vietnamese were far less scary than my stepmother. <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were worse shots. <laughs> 
Wow. Um, wow. And uh, it was um, it was very good. I was on a carrier. I was I joined to be in photography, but they put me in intelligence. Of course. And um, it was um, it was really really good to me. Did you it end was, up getting some training in photography? I, yeah, you know, here and there. But it, if anything, I don't know if you want to be trained if you're as a photographer from the military so much. Yeah. It, because it's the military. Yeah, that's mission specific photography. Yeah, as and they to tend art. to, yes. Yes. They tend to yeah. think along very conventional, yeah. linear yeah. lines. So out of the Navy, did you go back to school? I did. I went, well, I joined the Navy because there, there was no way I was going to ever afford an education. Right. So that was one of the reasons. So I went to... That good old GI Bill, thank God, right? Yeah. Went to Orange Coast College, got a degree in photography two year, and then I went on to San Francisco State and ended up getting a degree in international relations. Figuring that that would help me date Pan Am stewardesses... <laughs> After I graduated. You're so uh, honest about your motivations. Uh, yeah. I, I admire that about yeah, you. Yeah, no. <laughs> a little candid. <laughs> later, later I found out that wasn't the Not case. Not the best but way. Yeah, no, no, but that mm -hmm. was four years later. And yeah. I decided, Although war correspondent isn't a bad way to meet yeah. stewardess. But I don't want to oversell myself. I, I consider myself not a success at a war because when I... Um, when I came back, I had 20 bucks and three broken cameras. And so I don't want to oversell it. It was, it was a hell of an adventure. But that, and that's also a film era, right? In the mid-80s. You weren't shooting digital. In, no, in I was shooting film. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I had to bring it all in. Did you have like a portable dark room? No, it was all slide film. Even worse. Um, would you, but you, would you develop it? It was Kodachrome. Yeah, no, I did, couldn't develop it until no, I got back to to Paris. That's a tough process, Kodachrome. Yeah, I made it. So you'd keep the canisters. You'd shoot. You wouldn't know what you got. You'd have no yes. way of knowing what you got. Yes. And then every few months you'd go back? What was the... No. Um, I'm sorry, this isn't about the book, but I'm fascinated. Um, uh, so, we'll get to the book in a bit. Yeah, no, I went across overseas first to go to a war in Burma. So I did that, but then I got falciparin malaria. So then I met a, 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 another correspondent, written correspondent. He turned me on to Afghanistan. And then, so then this I is went romantic to, as hell. You understand that, Mark? This is... <laughs> This is you could have been. This is like Ernest Hemingway no. stuff here. No, if you went, if you had read my letters, you'd go, "Oh my God!" Um, Don't tell me that. I want to be <laughs> like, okay. "Wow!" And then I went to Cambodia, and then I went to India. Took a train through India. Took the bus over the border to Pakistan. Holy cow! And so you, because you're doing this on your own, you don't yes, have uh, yeah. Reuters writing the, the no, check here. No, you got to do it all on your own. Me. Me? That's a lot of initiative. Um, no, let's not consider. Uh, it's really insecurity, yeah. which really is a it's good motivator. <laughs> yeah. So you make it to Afghanistan, and and you obviously. I, what kind of camera were you shooting? I was shooting a, a Canon FTB, uh -huh. Uh -huh. a really thirty-five old, millimeter. Yes, thirty-five millimeter. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I had some, a couple of. Uh, three or four different lenses, some long lenses, because I was trying to get some shots of Russians as opposed to them shooting me. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine for war photography, the longer the lens, the better. You well, did get shot at, though, right? Um, many a time. Um, I, I'm going to uh, boost forward this thing, but I'll leave with a good story. Okay. Okay, and you can read on there. Uh, the three times... Uh, well, I was shot, almost shot many times, and most of them you never know. And war you just is hear like, this, and that's you know that no, was the one that didn't get you. No, you wouldn't even know because of different know. circumstances. Yeah. But the three times that um, that are memorable to me that I was almost shot, I all had my pants down, <laughs> and the and. <laughs> And the first time I, I almost got shot, um, one of the... Were you in the latrine? There's, there's a story there. <laughs> um, That's the, a very vulnerable in, position. In, I was in, never in a city in Afghanistan. So mm -hmm. if you're never in a city in Afghanistan... There's no uh, um, houses. As they say, the whole world's your latrine. Mm -hmm. um, so I was taking a path into Afghanistan from Peshawar, Pakistan, and we were in a long line of guerrillas, and I had to go off the line to go, 
you know, do my business. And then when I got up from doing my business and started heading back to the line of people walking, um, all I heard was about seven or eight um, clicks. And that was the bolts coming back oh. from an AK-47. Oh. Yeah, not a good sign. So I had to stand there with my pants down. and I thought there was a code among soldiers. You don't shoot somebody when they're... Uh, oh, no, no, you shoot... No, whenever you no, can. This huh? is Afghanistan. <laughs> you shot. Wow. So you... Okay. So anyway, uh, I, we'll go okay. find some of these pictures. Are they on your website? Because I'd love to see some of these images. It's some of them, yeah. yeah. And you had to shoot Kodachrome because that's what the... Uh, press agencies yeah, that's, wanted? Yeah, like a Time magazine. I mean, they were still kind of in between. It was kind of going between color and black and white at that time. Interesting. Where, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't in between film and digital. It was between color and black and white. Yes. Digital would come uh, much later. Yes. So after you got back from the war zones, did you continue to pursue photography? Yes. Um, I. Um, it took me a while. Um, I had to kind of rebuild my life. Um uh, it was really hard, but I ended up getting a job at the Orange County Register as a photographer. Great paper. Yeah. 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 And I did that for about two and a half years, and then I um, struck out on my own freelancing. Nice. That's what I You've did. You've been doing it ever since. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the book we're talking about today is a, a, a bunch of visual, he, he calls it a visual survey of vintage computers. Tell me how you got this idea. Well... I think I mentioned before one of my prime motivations is insecurity. <laughs> yes. So it was insecurity and fear. <laughs> it's a good motivator, I guess. Yeah, no, no. And <laughs> and the reason is, is it was around 2003. I ended up somehow at the museum. and The Computer I, History Museum. Correct. This is in San Jose. Uh, no, in uh, Mountain, Mountain View. View. Mountain View, I'm yes. sorry. There's yeah. the... The, the tech, which is in San Jose, Correct. the Computer History Museum, is is it the old Moffett Field uh, area? Is that where it is? Yeah. It's in that old blood I'll, hanger? I'll, I'm going to go, I'm going to jump forward and tell you how, then I'm going to give you a story about that, which is okay. so interesting okay. about the computer business, because it's just fascinating how okay. it all works together. But this is legendary, and this was started um, uh, by, um, oh, I, Gordon Bell's wife. Yes. Um, and I'm trying to remember her name, but she and uh, Gordon, who was a, a legendary digital equipment uh, designer, engineer, um, uh, was it Gwen Bell? I think it was. Anyway, they started the Computer History Museum because they realized that all, this was moving so fast, people weren't even thinking of his history. And thank goodness they did. It is history now. In fact, when I go through this book, and you saw me do it, I go, oh, I, had, oh, I remember, oh, I always wanted one of those. It really is history now. So oh. thank goodness they saved all this stuff. Um, and even the way we got it got to be the Computer History Museum is just shows the circular nature of Silicon Valley in the sense that uh, this is going to go quick, but I'm not in a hurry. It started. We got with, all day, Mark. Yeah, I wish. Steve. <laughs> it started with Steve Jobs, who bought Pixar. Pixar did a movie called Toy Story. Yes. Toy Story. Uh, was done on SGI computers. That's right, yes. Silicon Graphic. Yes. Silicon Graphics also bought Cray computers. The uh, legendary, the uh, legendary. big uh, uh, so monster computer There's company. that yeah. circle right there. Yeah. And then Silicon Graphics went bankrupt. Right. And then uh, Computer History Museum moved into Silicon Graphics into SGI headquarters. SGI facility. And also... Part of the other facilities Google moved into. Yes. So there's the circle. There it is, right there in Mountain View. Yeah. yeah. And that's all within a small area. So people can go to the Computer History Museum and see this stuff. Yes. Uh, you know, I don't think I've ever been. I remember when Gordon and Gwen started it, and I never got around to going. But let's go uh, virtually here. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so tempted to jump ahead. But they have stuff, they go way far back. And I think a lot of our... Older viewers will recognize these, <laughs> some with horror. These are punch cards. And if you ever had to program with punch cards, you knew the, the misery of punch cards. It was only slightly better than flipping switches on a front. And we've got, we've got some of that, too. Oh, I, yeah. Yeah, no, there's a CDC 6600. I have an image of that there. Wow. And uh, uh, I could show it to you. So 
Look, this is an adder, so this is a part of a larger computer. Um, yeah, that I, I think that's a reconstruction. It's a. It looks too nice. It's yes, not uh, it's all a German. Out it's a really. German, um, a Z3 adder. Yeah, it's from, I think it was prior to World War II or right around. That so this time. used telephone relays, and they used it to calculate, I would imagine, uh, trajectories and gunning and things like that. Early computers. That's kind of what they did. They were for military and, purposes. And actually, some of them used telephone relays to help break the codes. The even. Enigma codes. Uh, no, Here, Midway. Midway. Here's, uh, here's another German uh, computer with those switches we were talking about. Wow, look at that. Instead of a, a keyboard, you'd load your uh, loader program in by flipping a bunch of switches, then you'd load it, and then it would maybe, if you'd, everything went well, Start reading the paper tape so you wouldn't have to, or the or the punch cards so you wouldn't have to enter any more. This is so. Tell me a little bit about the process of taking these images because they're really gorgeous. So they're very close up. Yeah, I used the Canon um, for technical purposes. I'll just go through it quickly. Yeah, I used the Canon One uh, DS Mark II, okay. which was in the era when I shot this, which was m most of it was originally shot in 2005. Really? So these are older images. Yes. Now later, um, I worked for the museum and some of them are then done around 2009, 2010. But the book came out last year, so this is... Uh, the second edition. Actually, oh, this is the second edition. Second edition. Uh, originally came out in 2007. Okay. But well, I'll um, tell you though that, that uh, time has not... <laughs> Uh, uh, dimmed the luster of these uh, images. They're just, yeah. they're just they look gorgeous. Far better than I have aged. <laughs> <laughs> you, you told me that these are long exposures too. Yeah, um, I, I'm fairly familiar with lighting, and I think I basically came up with the looking in a lot of different ways to light it, and I had a lot of different views and uh, only so much time. So I actually ended up using the available light, which was very boring, very common, fluorescent lighting, much like you'd really? see in an office. Yeah. Isn't it kind of green and flickery? Uh, we're, we're shooting digital. Okay. And, so you could fix that. Um, yeah, you just change the color temperature. Right. It's consistent. And two, um, it, it kind of had a certain feel. It does have an industrial feel, doesn't yeah, it? it? Yeah, it does have a feel, and, yeah. and, 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 and I didn't have to worry about time, so I could use long exposures, um, sometimes as little as 20 seconds, but more closer to uh, around a minute. So flickering doesn't bother you at all. No. It and you were telling me before that you used a card uh, of a known uh, color, a 50% gray or something like that. Yeah, actually it's a whole color card, but you primarily you work off the gray. And, and that way you can white balance. And you cue from that because yeah. you know the color in the shade. Did you lose, uh, what did you, Photoshop, Lightroom? What did you use to? I, I used Photoshop. Yeah. 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 That was some... Um, a lot of these had to be post-produced in the sense of I wanted them to have a certain feel, and that was a... I didn't really, like, like transform colors into something they're a lot, but I, I, I gave it a certain contrast, and also I tried to make lines very, very straight. Ah, uh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. You don't want converging lines, because it's... Yeah, in it's some ways I the, had yeah. to photograph with lenses... Because I couldn't move the computer. So you'd have tilt shift lenses or something. Well, like that. no, I'd have to. There wasn't even that wouldn't work because I couldn't get back far enough. So then I just use Photoshop to straighten out ah, the lines. Got it. Oh, I just I can't put this book down. Actually, uh, we're going to be back with Mark in just a second. I, he asked me uh, after the uh, interview which image I would like to have a print of so I can frame it and put it on my wall. Now, as you watch the show. You might, uh, you might look at the images and decide which one you'd like to print out. And I'll tell you in the next break, I'll tell you which one I picked. But meanwhile, let's talk about our sponsor today, Zip Recruiter. Zip Recruiter is the solution for people who have to do hiring. I know sometimes it feels like a thankless task, hiring the next uh, employee. And if you're a, a sole proprietor, it could be... More than a thankless task, it can be a daunting task. I mean, you're busy, you're down a person, and you got to hire somebody new. 
ZipRecruiter is there to help. ZipRecruiter is the easiest, fastest way to get to the right person for that job. And believe me, you don't want to cut corners on hiring the next employee. That person makes or breaks your company. Fortunately, ZipRecruiter is easy to use. It's fast, and it's it's going to deliver such great results for you. Let me explain why ZipRecruiter is special. First of all, one posting on ZipRecruiter gets your job listing to over 100 job boards and social networks like Twitter and Facebook. And the advantage of that is you're more likely to reach that corner of the Internet where the one person who'd be perfect for that job is lurking. That person's out there. you got to spread the word far and wide so that you're, you're going to find them. You're going to get to them so they can see it. But... ZipRecruiter takes another step that makes it absolutely unique. ZipRecruiter, of course, because people come to ZipRecruiter applying for jobs, has millions of resumes. Uh, well, I don't want to exaggerate. Maybe hundreds of thousands of resumes. A lot. Uh, current resumes of people looking for work. The first thing they do when you put that job listing up on ZipRecruiter, after they post it to the other sites, is they then scan thousands of resumes to find the right person for your job. Their powerful matching technology helps them basically automatedly find the right people with the right experience. And then they send them a note saying, hey, we think we might have found a perfect job for you. And they invite them to apply. As the applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one, spotlights the top candidates, so you'll never miss a great match. And I have to tell you, this comes from my own experience. Lisa and I have used ZipRecruiter, and it's remarkable. In fact, you know, when that person quits and gives you notice as our bookkeeper did some months ago it's it's dejecting it was hard for lisa because she knew she was gonna have to do the job if she didn't find somebody fast she said oh, i don't want to go through this process i said let's do it this was at breakfast let's post on zip recruiter this is a perfect chance so she did and you should have watched over the first few hours of the day before lunch her smile got wider and wider she said oh look oh this is this guy's great oh Here's another one. We had three or four really qualified candidates in the first few hours. Now, I can't promise your experience to be exactly like that, but four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate on the site within the first day. So this is amazing technology that flips everything on its head. All of the uh, applicants go into the ZipRecruiter interface, not into your inbox or on your phone, and you can easily review them. They've pre-format all the resumes, so they, it's easy for you to scan through them. They give you screening questions so you can eliminate people without doing anything. It's just automatically who don't fit your needs. I can go on and on, but I want you to try this free right now. Yeah, free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. I, you know, I hope you will remember that maybe you're not hiring right now. Make a note of this. Maybe that time, that next time when you're sitting down to breakfast and you're thinking, I have to I have to do job search, job applicants today, and you're going, oh, I don't want to do this. I have stuff to do. Maybe it'll ding. Oh, this would be a good time to use ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. I'm telling you, it is life-changing. ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. ZipRecruiter really is the smartest way to hire. Now back to my conversation with Mark Richards. You know, I interrupted you. What gave you the impetus to do this in the first place? Oh, yeah. Back to insecurity and being scared. <laughs> um, so uh, photography had started to change. And I was an early conscript, I guess you could say, of digital. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember that battle well. In fact, I didn't I didn't go digital till 2001 or 2002. And I know a lot of photographers fought it because they said, well, it's not as good as film. I don't know why. The, I, now I, we can look back and say, that was nuts. Yeah, no, I've seen plenty of 35, 2 and a quarter. And even back then, the files back then from that era, 2005, are fantastic. Yeah. And um, so... Well, 1DS is a pretty good camera. 1DS Mark II. Mark II. Yeah. Not even... Mark yeah, one. not even it's Mark one. It's a pretty one. good camera. I'm, it's I'm the camera. Mark one. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Original Mark. Uh, but no, boom. Um, so <laughs> back to the story of yes. why I knew the photography was changing. Um, my my whole thing was um, 
Well, I'm going to be perfectly honest. I wasn't like the number one photographer, even the number two. I would have rated myself number three or number four within the Bay Area. Yeah. And for a certain type, and I just knew that wasn't going to change. I mean, that wasn't going to remain. Yeah. I was going to have to re do something. Something unique. Yeah. And I couldn't really do photojournalism. Mm. I mean, I had done everything from street gangs to Haiti, da da da. But that wasn't going to. Would you have been shot three times without your pants on? No, no, I didn't get shot. Oh, shot at? <laughs> Almost. Aimed at? Aimed at. <laughs> no. <laughs> you kind of, it pales, I would guess. Yeah. Yeah. So you're looking yeah. for something a little I was, more sedate, calmer. And a, and a chance to excel. I have to change. Yeah. The dic the times dictated yeah, yeah. it. And so I saw this and I just thought, boom. Did you go to the museum and look at them and say, well, those yeah. are pretty? I, I just want to show you the one image, what the, the, the key image that kind of... The inspiration. Yeah. I mean, there was many... Oh, look at that. That is... You know what? That is beautiful. I'm going to hold it up this way yeah, so let me, um, take that off can see it because it's a, it's a two-page spread. And that is wiring, my friends. Is that a Cray? What is that? What no, is that's that? an Iliac. Iliac, a Iliac very early computer. Four. It's a supercomputer. They only made, I think, one or two. It was used in like a nuclear uh, designed or and or weather. I'm not sure about. And these this were one. hand wired. I yes, mean, and now you know why they were so problematic. But when I saw this, I don't know if any of your viewers, listeners, are familiar with. Uh, 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 Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah. But he has some very beautiful, um, they were mostly drawings of um, autopsy. Yes. Different bodies. And this when you is a look little at like that, that. It's yes. like muscles. And arteries. And, and, and arteries veins and, and veins, the blue and the red. Yeah. And, and that's one of my sub themes about this is how, how these are made by men and women. And they res they have some weird resemblance in some of them too. It's very fascinating. To it's me. not surprising, really. I think we reinvent ourselves all the time, right? And that's uh, anything. Uh, they always say that an organization's creations are really the manifestation of the way the organization's. Well, look at the term up. computer. What is the term computer? It's computing, a thing that could, a person that computes. It was a person. Yeah, it was women. Mostly. It was actually yeah. a woman. Yeah. It only became a thing later, but at first it was a human a person. being. So yeah. we kind of converted it back yeah. and forth. There's this weird um, sense of like, well, w you know, we were humans and now we're trying to become robots and I don't know. There's this infestation of both species, humans and computers when you go back to the really early days and you look at these tube based computers this is ENIAC which was used in World War II to calculate uh, ballistics um, and it's, it, the tubes are beautiful they really are beautiful and then you look behind them and the relays and the switches and the wiring half a million tubes in this because half a million dollars to make and actually more than half a million tubes I think uh, it says in here 18,000 tubes 48 separate eight foot high racks cost half a million in 1940 dollars to build this is gorgeous just gorgeous these are all in surprisingly good shape uh given their age yeah um i think that that uh, the bells did a great job of here's univac I think people have heard that name. Yeah, that's uh, that was one of the problems was memory, and that used um, a unique mercury. Yeah, and that's from the unit. That was a that was the yeah. Unit. I want this in the studio. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> isn't that great? So it's a keyboard, uh, I guess a teletype. Yeah, it's the input they call it. The yeah. input, and I don't know what this is worse than a seven forty seven cockpit. That uh, is crazy. Yeah, yeah. Look at these. This is the Wisconsin Integr... I never heard of this, WISC. Integrally, integrally synchronized computer. Oh, yeah. But you do know probably the name of the creator, Gene Amdahl, uh, who later went on, of course, to create the Amdahl Corporation. WISC. Maybe now, went to there's Wisconsin, a really good that. story about all those tubes. Look at them. Yeah. See all those tubes? Yeah. At near the end of its use... Americans stopped making them, so they had to source them from guess where? Russia. 
Right. They still, you know what? If you're a ham, you know that because that's the last place you can yeah. get these tubes, ham radio tubes. Wow. Yeah, similar. Yep. So there's another circular story. Yeah. Some of these things were used in air intercept modes. Now, this is a very interesting. If you look at this thing, you see this right down here? There's bullet holes in it. Uh, whoa. So there's bullet holes in this. This is whisk again. Yeah. Why was whisk shot at? Uh, because it was used as a backstop for a target because it was no longer... <laughs> And this is why Gwen and Gordon had to start the Computer History Museum. And for some reason it says here in French, Allez-vous, le stop code. <laughs> le stop code right here, folks. There you go. If you like Halt and Catch Fire, this is the original. Look at this. Johnniac. Rand Corporation. You know... These really are uh, transitional devices. This is almost the missing link between those human computers and the computers of today. I mean, this is, this is as base as you can get. Look at this stuff. Yeah, what they did. With, Amazing. Um, we, we stand all on the shoulders of so many other people. Would you, would you go, oh, now, here's something really pretty. And you said you have this up on the wall. Uh, in your house, can you can I buy these prints from your website? Because I would love a print of this. Oh yeah. Do you sell prints? Oh yeah. yeah I'm, I hope um, so. Do you see this right here? This is my soul, <laughs> and you can you can buy it's it. It's available <laughs> at a very fair yeah. price. No, yeah, no. <laughs> so you said you have this hanging. This is core memory, and, and kids today don't understand because we have gigabytes of RAM in our computers. That in the early days, memory was literally magnetic cores. With cross wires, and you could see it if you look closely enough. And that's how we got the term bits from there? Bits. It w was part of how they configured the memory, right? And we still say core dump, even though there's no core, dump. core memory. <laughs> and there's actually a better, uh, really great picture of those little magnetic cores. Zero and one, that's all yeah. it is. And... Uh, of course, you can address each one individually if you know it's horizontal and yeah. And so um, this and one right here. Yeah. You have to call sir. Sir. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. <laughs> Could you start? Yeah. Start up. I, yeah. Yeah. So these. This must be a fairly. This is like a, you're using a macro lens or something. Yes. These, yes. You? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just to show, uh, you know how terrifically, um, back then it was a, a physical item. And you see now we have, we've added, we've improved it, parity checking. We have the cross wire that's literally a parity check wire. Wow. So, yeah. I don't know why I know that. I, I, I thought they only had those at Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Sage, the semi-automatic ground environment. This, is keep, this was keeping us safe from the Ruskies. Yeah, but um, it, also some of the code in the back of it ended up, being origination to the American Airlines reservation system. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't the same, but it led to. It led to. Yeah. And almost as soon as this was brought forth, it was uh, out of date because the Soviets had ICBMs after yeah. that. And didn't, the bombers really didn't, didn't send out B-52s yeah. yeah. anymore, yeah. Oh, sorry. And you know what? The tubes I said before was really these tubes. I made a mistake. These, these are these, these are tubes. Rusky was, tubes yes. used to protect us from the Soviet Union's yes. atomic Air Some Force. of them could have been from other uh, Iron Curtain countries, yeah. but yes. So what is that? Oh, that was a target uh, illuminator. So if you had the radar here, I'll go backwards and... This was it, and you'd have a target, right? They yeah. would display, and then you could... You'd point at it with your yeah. little target illuminator. Right, and then you'd go, bang. <laughs> and, uh, and that was it, right? It's amazing <laughs> we survived. Look at all this. Yeah, yeah. Look, at the, look at that dial. The telephone. The dial. Yeah. You still have this? Now, kids, when you say dial the phone, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And when I say kids, I mean anybody under 40. Oh, don't <laughs> remind me. 
I just turned oh, 64, so and I yeah. look at 40s, and I hate them. Yeah. And I used to look at 18-year-olds, yeah, and right, I hate them. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. We thought by it's 40 years old, fair. you're ancient, right? Yeah. Anybody, don't trust anybody over 30. The 004. <laughs> See, I love the space age fonts and lettering that they used, because companies like IBM knew that people wanted this to be futuristic. Now, that's actually a Japanese computer. Is it really? The yeah. Nippon Electric Company. Oh, yeah, I see yeah. it right there. Yeah. That became, of course, NEC, and they're still around. Yes. Making computers. Look at that. Yes, yeah, Space Age. There was a little bit of marketing that went into this, too. The 542. Now, this guy, this guy uh, was guiding your Minuteman missiles. Yes, yes. That's wow. right, and and just think, this is before Google Maps. <laughs> so there was, it was no GPS at all. Yeah, so it was yeah. much harder back then you, you to you find to, directions. Uh, you know, you had to do uh, inertial guidance. Philco Corporation, the Philadelphia Electric Company, they're long gone, but the name lives on. Wow, you you know a lot too. Oh, I I went I I didn't use these computers, but uh, pretty close. Yeah. You know, you know, this reminds me of like when I was, um, I was in the Navy at uh, April 30th, 1975, and that was the day we evacuated Saigon. I remember that. And so day. it was very historical yeah. to me. Yeah. And I used to have a Were sister. helicopters coming in from Saigon? Yeah, we helped ship? push them off. I'm wow. actually in, um, in, in a movie. Um, um, you could see me taking a picture as they push off the copters. Um, I remember from the embassy. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. That. It was on U.S. I was on the USS Han Hancock. Wow. Another great story. It was made to defeat the Japanese, and at the end, when it was uh, turned into scrap, it was sold to the Toyota Motor Corporation. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that uh, Toyota Land Cruiser you're driving made That's a little right. has a little bit USS Hancock. <laughs> <laughs> the USS Hancock in it. Wow. Um, yeah, so... Um, this is um, a legendary computer, the System 360. This is, hmm. for a lot of people, what computing was in the 60s. Um, oh, in I fact, think. if you saw the show Mad Men, hmm. when they got computerized and they put in the raised floor and the sealed room... It was almost certainly a System 360 that yeah, they were putting and in. There's a picture of the disk drives in there, and I think it's further down. The five megabyte Winchester drives? No, no. I'm sorry, not disk drives, there you go. tape drives. Oh, yeah, but, but there's a disk there. These are disk drives. Yeah. You had to be very careful when you pulled those out because there was a lot of angular momentum. They were still spinning, and they could, they, they could pull you across the room yeah. if you weren't careful. That reminds me <laughs> when I was 40 and I had angular momentum. <laughs> yes, by now in our 60s, we've both lost our angular momentum, yeah. Mark. It's, uh, just, <laughs> there you go. There's the, there's there's the, the drives. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're not the drives, the tape drives. Sorry. Look at those. 360. We had, I don't think we had a 360 in the old screensaver set, but we did have an old main, IBM mainframe. Okay, you know what that is? Okay, I don't know. I see Raytheon, I see erasable driver module, current switch module, sense amplifier module. What are these? Now, if we just look at it like, um, sorry, like this, just... Just highlight this area. It almost looks like a musical instrument. It does. It looks like a yeah. stave. I almost expect to see a G clef there. That's the uh, Apollo navigation system. You're kidding. No. This is what landed us on the moon. Yes. Now, that's a prototype, but it was made out of MIT and I think of somebody else. But yeah, it's the Apollo guidance system. Imagine the history there. Uh, I, I just keep thinking, I see an E flat is what I see. <laughs> You know, you could play this. Yeah, no, no, you can navigate, and it's a, it's a xylophone. 4K RAM, 24K ROM. That was the code. That was the firmware. Cost a quarter of a million dollars to build. This is in 1965. Of course, they wouldn't land on the moon for a few more years, but um, that is a lot of history. And this yeah. is all at the Computer History Museum yes, in Mountain View. Yes, yes. And, and this is another piece that you just look at it and you're struck by the duality. It's a beautiful piece of art. If you just take it out of its contact, yeah. you go, wow, some sculptor made that. And yeah. in fact, some sculptor did, it's but true. They, they called them engineers. Yeah. And, I, and it's 
that was one of the crazy things when I when I went there. I said, uh, "Look, you guys and gals, you you have art here," and I had to convince them. It took a little convincing that they saw it more like along the lines of engineering. I'm sure people did see it as art, but I just thought these are beautiful pieces, just gorgeous. Thank you. We'll have. I'm thanking myself. Uh, thank you, Leo. We'll be back with more of Mark Richards in just a little bit. Uh, this was an interview we recorded earlier, uh, a couple of actually almost a month ago. I had so much fun, and as I mentioned in our last break, Mark, at the end of the interview, as he's leaving, says, "Hey, you know, you should pick a image you like, and I'll I'll make a print for you, so you could put it up on your wall." Because I love great photography, and I have a lot of nice photographs in our studio. And I really thought I looked at them all. Have you been watching? Did you see this yet? This is the one I'm going to get printed up. And actually, I just love this. This is the prototype from MIT, the engineering prototype of the Apollo guidance computer that first landed men on the moon. And there's an extra nice piece, as, as Mark mentioned in here, this little bit of analog circuitry, which looks so much like a music stave. Isn't that beautiful? So... After I thought about it and I looked through it, I said, you know what, Mark? This is historic and beautiful. What a great picture. The Apollo guidance computer. This is the engineering prototype from 1965, four years before we landed on the moon. We'll get back to core memory in just a bit. But first, a word from our sponsor, a great discovery for anybody who's looking for business software. I know <laughs> sometimes <laughs> your business computer looks like that, right? <laughs> It's, you're using it still, but it could be better. You know, that line of business software you're using to run your veterinary uh, uh, practice has switches like this with Dymo labels on it. We can do better. There's great software out there, modern software for your business. The problem is, how do you know what's good? Where do you find it? That's why I tell everybody about Captera. Captera is an is a uh, uh, an index of uh, a directory of all the best business software. I mean, all of it. Seven hundred specific categories of software, uh, thousands of programs in every area from project management, email marketing, yes, veterinary management, yoga studio management, any line of business software you can imagine. It's on Captera. But, there's, but it's better than that. There's 800,000 reviews by actual users, and Captera is really good. They vet all those reviews to make sure they're real users and they're real-world experience. So when you're looking at software, you'll know immediately, is this good? They have a great comparison system that lets you check the features you want and then side-by-side -side compare all the programs that work for that, read all the reviews, and then, in many cases, free trials. You can go to the website. It is so much better than Googling it or asking a colleague. you got to go to Captera. C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A. -R -R -A. No matter what kind of software your business needs, Captera makes it easy to discover the right solution fast. Replace that old PDP-11 <laughs> running your line of business software with something a little bit more modern. <laughs> Yeah, this was our computer. <laughs> In the early days of Twit, we were using that compact. No. <laughs> Captera.com slash triangulation. Find the right tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Better stuff really is out there. And you can find it at C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash triangulation. Captera is software selection simplified. And it, oh, did I, I forgot the most important part. How much would you pay for that service? It's free. It's free. Free, free. Always free. No secret hidden fee. It's free. Captera.com slash triangulation. Now back we go to Mark Richards. We're talking to Mark Richards. He's the author of a brand new book. No, it's not brand new. It's a second edition just came out. Core Memory, a visual survey of vintage computers featuring machines from the Computer History Museum. And you very generously have posted many of these images on your website, markrichards.photoshelter.com. So yeah, or you can just go to markrichards.com. That'll redirect. But buy the book because... Oh, thank you. Look at this. Wouldn't yes. you want... Put this on your coffee table. And the, I don't know, but I think there's a certain kind of person, I'm one of them, who would see this and go, oh... And the next hour is going to be spent going through. Oh, thank you. So there. Look at this beautiful musical yeah. stage. And 
Look at that other part of the memory there, the green and gold. Yeah. It's just, um, I'm, I'm mesmerized at how beautiful they are. And, you know, I'm also mesmerized by the engineering, what they did with so little. Um, it's a beautiful duality. That's what drew me to it. You know, and I love the, uh, the text in the book, too. You quote here, Margaret Hamilton, who I think people know her name now, but at the time was little known. She was the woman who was the director of software engineering at MIT's Instrumentation Laboratory, who wrote the code for the, the lunar lander. In fact, she developed the term, soft, created the term software engineering. No one had, no one had called yeah. it that before. I, I think it's um, so many women within here, and even now in Silicon Valley, there's this kind of myth that it's male this and male yeah. that. Yeah. It's been both. Many of us have seen, and I hope you have the picture of uh, Margaret Hamilton standing next to the, the six-foot-tall uh, printouts of the code that uh, she created yeah. that helped Apollo. There was no HP calculator no. either. <laughs> it was hard work. Actually, there probably were HP calculators, but it was still pretty, pretty hard 70s. work. 70s. No. Yeah, 60s. No. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so no, there she is before. with her stack of... Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's just incredible. Yeah. yeah, Apollo code, yeah. Yeah. Wow. This uh, Now we're getting into something that I think some of our viewers will recognize because uh, Steve Gibson's first computer was a PDP-8, and he has a few of them sitting behind him. Replicas, uh, Oscar Vermeulen's amazing replicas of uh, PDP-8 sitting behind him in his uh, studio. And, of course, as soon as you see this, you say, wait a minute, this is the L-Cars console from Star Trek. Because mm. it really has that, and obviously the Star Trek designers were very much influenced. Here's I the mean, switches it you flipped. could be a keyboard of uh, musicians. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. the choice of colors. And very everything. pop seventies. There's the full, the full shot of a PDP eight facade. Uh, was, the first Pong was on that, was it not? Yeah, PDP eight yeah. or PDP. Some I have uh, Oscar has uh, also made a PDP eleven, and I have a replica in my office of the PDP eleven, running in front of a Raspberry Pi, which has much more computing power than the eight or the eleven. Mm. Um, mm. These are these are amazing. Four K four K of RAM in this. It was a twenty eight thousand dollar computer, the DDP sixteen, first sixteen bit mini computer. Wow, look at that. Sure sure to excite all those nerds among us. Um, oh, yeah, you could and, almost afford this. And I can hear my girlfriend now as I get to excitement. She goes, next. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, Mark, that's fascinating. That's fine. That's Inside fine. voice. <gasps> again, the wiring, uh, and again, hand-wired. Uh, you know, this is... This is before the days of printed circuits. Yeah. And uh, you had to really, you had to know what you were doing. Mm. You know, the paint's taking effort that went into this. Here's the control data CDC 6600. Yes. That is a very nice choice on your part. I mean, this, it's a human. Yes, that's exactly this what a, I was thinking. Yeah, this is a great, yeah. a, a great image. That's yeah. uh, uh, also behind that computer was Mr. Cray. He was a big part of that. He went on to bigger and better things. He was but, a young guy at the time, Seymour Cray. Of course, yeah, later yeah. started the supercomputer now, company. Now, see that line of switches? That's called a dead start board. <laughs> and, and you know, and I, this is what I look like before coffee. <laughs> the dead start. Yeah. But so I know what you do with this. Now, somebody looked at that picture... Now, yeah. I couldn't touch anything because it's no, a museum. No, no, you can't change those switches. Right, but somebody looked at it and pointed out, and I can't remember what he said. He goes, when he looked at the photo, he goes, that switch is wrong. You've got a bug. Right, no, he actually he knew, knew the coordination. And the reason is you couldn't use these computers until you loaded in by hand using switches the load it, loader program. That had to be hand programmed in because RAM didn't get saved. And then once the loader program was loaded, you could read the paper tape or the punch cards or the magnetic tape to load the operating system. But humans had to hand enter these. And people did it so often, they had it memorized. And now, your, your yeah, friend obviously knew. And, and um, just think, 
He memorized that and probably forgot his kid's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> he, he just he got them all you know, mixed that switch, up. Uh, that should be down. Why, yeah. why is that up? Yeah. You, Somebody's been messing with this. Yeah. You ain't going to load any paper tape today. That's right. Could you imagine the kids coming in on the weekend? What's this for, Dad? <laughs> this is the uh, latest hairstyle with all the kids uh, mm. today. Uh, wow, look at that. You would think that that's a bad job, right, John? We, we used, this is what the back of our rack used to look like. But in fact, there really isn't any choice. That's how it has to look, I yeah. guess. I That's the top of my head with the look. <laughs> here's That's the, the actual. Here's some of the actual uh, switches yeah. on the dead start. Wow, this is a CDC 6600. Here's an imp. Now, this is an important computer. Yes, and um, that was the start of the ARPANET, which was the pre predecessor to the Internet. And I, um, the first message set on the internet was low, low. L O, because they were trying to type in log on and the system <laughs> crashed. You know what? Low is a little more biblical and right low. on. I thought it should have been. Behold ye my works. Yeah, I thought it should have said yo, but yo. That, was, that was way before that time. I think low is nice Low, and but I just love the first thing they start off, it crashed. And like, nothing's changed. Uh, yeah, the first, the early internet, this was a, a connection between imp processors designed by Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. You see the BBN logo there. This is something. This this is really fairly important to see uh, this computer, the first packet router yeah. for ARPANET, the, yeah. the predecessor. Between and this is this you. is what JCR Licklider, when you when you read the story of the early days of the internet, this is what they were talking about, these imp processors in Boston and Stanford and and um, I just want to point out, being the um, California that I am, it was all in California. It was from SRI or SRI, Stanford yeah. Res Research yeah. to UCLA. So, yeah. yay, for California. Wow. It, uh, this is Machine 10, by the way, in case you're mapping out the early days of the Internet. <laughs> Collect them all. Collect all 10. <laughs> we've, actually, we've seen, and Steve has shown it, uh, the uh, hand-drawn map of the first ARPANET and uh, one of these is uh, in there and probably number 10. Look for number 10. Well, you could figure out where it was uh, located. Wow, that is something. <laughs> this is, they call this a kitchen computer. Really? Really? The Honeywell H360. Kind of a hype thing. Neiman Marcus. This was in the Neiman Marcus catalog. They didn't Did sell one. Not one. No. no but marketing was, was beautiful. It huh? wasn't a bad deal. It was only 10 grand. <laughs> uh, you got 4K uh, memory. Yeah. You had to hand it under your, your recipes. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. They didn't sell a one, but remember at the time, Neiman Marcus would always have a crazy product at the back yeah. of the catalog. Just uh, I would have just entered peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> P, P, and J. It's only three, four <laughs> letters. It's easy. Um, this is a a personal computer, and... In your text, and uh, I should say not your text, but in John Alderman's text, uh, he says this is the first personal computer was sold as a kit in Scientific American 1971, and I am not familiar with a Ken Back one. Maybe because and you've it lived a full life. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that. Maybe because I was dating at the time. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You were, yeah. Hey, hey, you want to you want to hear something? Yeah. <laughs> no. No. I don't. I don't. Well, I tell you why this didn't sell a whole bunch and become famous. It did. It lacked kind of a critical processor. It didn't have a microprocessor. It didn't have really anything. It input and output were limited to these switches and lights. It had two hundred fifty six bytes, so it was really more a toy. But I think people who built this kit were very proud of the fact they had one of the first personal computers. That's right. And they really didn't share it much because they would have been committed. There are still... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's not a personal computer. Uh, that's just... Now, this... Yeah. This set you back a little. This is an HP 35 calculator. And, uh, you know, you can get emulators for your iPhone if you really want to play with this, but it was... HP's RPM um, calculators, uh, you know, 1972. Wow. So a story about calculators. I was in photo intelligence, as I oh, specified yeah. earlier, yeah. and we asked them 
as we went to see, why can't we use calculators? And they said, well, they have batteries, yeah? And, I, and we said to them, well, yeah. so? Yeah. And so we had to learn how to use a slide rule. No batteries. No batteries. No batteries. If the power unlike, goes out. Unlike jet airplanes or <laughs> nuclear anything weapons else. or anything yeah. else. Okay, this is history. You know what that is? That's super paint. This is uh, back in Xerox Park days in the early 70s. This was a computer, but that was also software. It was a graphics computer, 8-bit per pixel frame buffer. This was the earliest days of bitmap displays and the very first computer painting program, Super Paint. That name actually lived on uh, in, in software for some years. But there is, that's, wow. Wow. Yeah, it's so beautiful. I just, all I, I don't know why, maybe this is just me, but I feel like if I had a little marinara sauce, <laughs> I would, this would be delicious. Maybe that's just me. I don't, um, I, I don't I, know. Yeah. I don't know. <gasps> okay, now, now we're talking. This yeah. is actually you the know, first well known kit computer. This is uh, also known as the uh, Bill Gates porn site. That's right. <laughs> When Bill Gates, actually it was Steve Ballmer, saw this on the cover of, I think it was Popular Mechanics magazine, he came running into Bill Gates' Harvard dorm room and slapped him upside the head and said, look at this. And you know what? They don't have any software. There could be a business there. I, I think it was the same dorm room um, Mark Zuckerberg. Later, Mark in. Zuckerberg yeah, wrote yeah. the uh, formula for, for, for uh, Facebook on the window, I believe, yeah. Popular Electronics Magazine is the, yeah, this was the cover story. The Mitz Altair. And you, it's hard to imagine the excitement that this generated because unlike the Kinac or whatever that was, this was a computer that actually had a microprocessor. Uh, and it, people were very excited. What it did lack was a programming language, and that's what Bill Gates and Paul Allen wrote, mm. uh, which was Alt Mitz mm. uh, Basic and uh, Altair Basic. And that became kind of the key to the whole thing software plus hardware wow this is amazing in fact mitz was uh, i think in albuquerque that's why microsoft started in albuquerque because mm. paul and uh, and bill and uh, steve thought they should be down there pretty amazing pretty amazing and there's the iliac four that sounds like uh, iliac seems like this should have been before the mitts out here. Yeah, I think iliac is what you need to go to a stomach doctor. That's for. what it sounds like. You have yeah. iliac disease. Oh, I hate it when that happens. <laughs> 1975. This is from Burroughs Corporation. Are you ready for this? Thirty-one million dollars was caught. You know why? I don't know why? Because it was funded by the Pentagon. Yeah, for, <laughs> yeah. I think it did nuclear detonation yeah. simulations. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, you know, in a weird sort of way, I studied all about uh, negotiations for nuclear um, devices and stuff. And that hap came about because they stopped doing uh, atmosphere testing. Yeah. So in a weird sort of way, supercomputer development was aided by that because they had to stimulate. They, they, I mean, they not were, stimulate. But. Well, it was stimulating, but they were simulating. <laughs> they were stimulating, simulating. Yeah, simulation um, of stimulation. Yeah, in some cases. Yeah. Now, some cases. That's they, interesting. So when they ended uh, uh, testing. Air in 63, I think it was. They and said, we've got to build something to, that can actually simulate a nuclear explosion. I, they did it more now. After that, they did do underground testing. I don't know what the cutoff, how long they did underground ground testing but this this computer iliac according to the uh, text here was uh, originally at the university of illinois which of course had a big supercomputing center that's where later mark andreessen would uh, yeah. write mosaic and uh and because of anti-war protests in 1970 they became concerned for it in fact activists called for a day of illy action because they <laughs> they were <laughs> I don't know if I would want the bumper <laughs> uh, sticker for that. But anyway. Uh, uh, what happened to drum circles? <laughs> <laughs> Illy action. And so they had to move this. And this actually was moved to Mountain View, to NASA Ames, where the Computer History Museum is. Yes. So this is the, f maybe you could say this was the first computer in the Computer uh. History Museum. 
This is the one that inspired you too. Oh yeah, wow, yeah, yeah the this. most this inspiring of all. Yeah. Uh, oh, now here we go with Seymour Cray's uh, first creation. This is a supercomputer, and <laughs> you know, later he put a sofa around it, which was a little strange. But if you look clear, carefully, um, you can see the wiring. I, I think there. that's actually the later one. The, this the, came after the sofa. Yes, yes. <laughs> I think that's Cray 3. Which oh, this is the 3, okay. I think. Um, this has 2, 1985. Okay, two. So trust that. Don't trust me. Yeah. Oh, wait. I, I don't remember which one had the sofa. Um, I think it was, you'll see. Is it's it in here? here? Yeah, I think Oh, so. my God, look at these wire bundles. Yeah. Cray, at least they finally put socketed plugs on the end of them so you could at least what what could go wrong replace them yeah holy cow a lot of hand work uh, went into that there, there here is, we go there's the this is the cray one uh the early cray <laughs> and, and was furniture and a computer and this was all uh, bathed in the special fluid called the uh, Floral, I think it was called floral net. It was a to cool, keep it cool. So imagine this all was in fluid there and humming. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Mm. Supercomputers. You know, you've got one in your pocket now, but uh, um, in these days, this was a this was a big deal. That sounds wrong, but yes, you do though. I mean, the power, the processing power. Of these supercomputers is really dwarfed by modern. Uh, I was mobile just technology. thinking of the visual of a supercomputer in, in my, your pocket. In my pocket, <laughs> and I'm it happy didn't to see sign, you. Yeah, now, wrong. this is a good one, and this is signed by somebody you all know. Uh, this is the original Apple One with its wooden case. Was uh, sold this at the Homebrew Computer Club. He sold the plans for it. You could build it yourself. Now the case was added. All you actually bought was yeah. the. Um, yeah, but I'm sure there are people selling <laughs> wooden cases yes. in the back of the room. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, but it was sure. a kit. This was a kit, and yes. you had to do it all yourself. But that's, uh, of course, Steve, very famously, Steve Jobs said, you know, what we could do is we could assemble these pre... Actually, he wanted to sell them to a computer store. They said, well, you got to sell a kit. If you want to pre-assemble a few of these, I'll sell those. So that's where the garage got powered up. I love it. You got They got Waz's uh, signature on this. Mm-hmm. Wow, this is this is where this is where modern history, I guess, uh, begins. That's another version. Of yeah. Somebody put it together. Like In 1976, that. Apple won, and they they go for a pretty penny these days. I think uh, I just saw an Apple One sell for several hundred thousand dollars. Oh wow! Yeah, uh, we had, had an Apple uh, Apple One on uh, on set. Remember, uh, Mitch Wait had an Apple One. He was trying to put together. He got it working again. He wanted to sell it. I don't know if he ever did sell it, but we had Mitch on triangulation with his Apple One. Here, a little bit. This will, I would bet you a lot of you would recognize this maybe from your uh, school days in the Oregon Trail. Uh, this is the computer that killed so many with dysentery. It's the Apple II computer. Hey, this was not, a, this was very inexpensive. $1,298. It came with 48K of RAM. I'm sorry, 4K of RAM. If you wanted 48K of RAM, double that. More than double that. That is... I remember the 48K. People who had a 48K Apple II. Those were, those were fancy people. Yeah, that was, the, uh, that was the equivalent of driving a Tulsa. To <laughs> Tesla, sorry. A Tesla, yeah. yeah in you Tulsa. 48K? <laughs> that's, that's equivalent of having a P100D Tesla. That ain't, that ain't no just off-the-shelf Tesla. This is one that uh, I knew so many sports writers yeah. and people fell in love with. This is a Tandy Model 100. The good old trash. Trash. The trash. Yeah, huh. yeah but it, this I don't think anybody called this a trash, even though it was technically a trash 80. It was always the Model 100. And it was because even though you only had four or five lines on here, maybe there were eight, I can't remember. And you had a full keyboard and you could connect this to a modem and file copy right from the ballpark. And this was an amazing computer. I, I, uh, I always, I eventually got one, but at the time I couldn't afford them. They were a whole four hundred dollars. Um, Don mm -hmm. French. This was this was incredible, incredible. The Tandy Model One Hundred. There's a trash eighty. 
And this was reasonably called the Trash 80 because every time you touch the keyboard, static electricity would shoot from your fingers and kill the whole darn thing. <laughs> these were the, I, I these, still have that problem. Yeah, these, these were so unreliable. So many uh, dead animals yeah. around me. You have a great quote in here from the a 1980 Superman comic. Gee, the TRS-80 really does think as fast as Superman. Golly. <laughs> Golly. <laughs> oh, what's this? I don't oh, recognize this. Oh, this is the first porn machine. Well, and if you lived in France, anyway. Yes, yes, indeed. But, you know, the... Um, Remember that time in Afghanistan, I ended up meeting a French doctor. And later on, we were in Paris, and she had that in her house. And it was, I, I didn't use it for nefarious things because I could hardly spell my name in French, uh, let alone in anything else. This was but, a crazy thing because in the early 80s, the French phone company wanted to get rid of phone books. And they put one of these in every house in France. Yes. Yeah, they were so far. They they had it, they had it all there. And you call it porn. I don't think it had graphics particularly, no. but you could have yeah. sexy chat. Yeah, there was. It was utilized. I I, I don't want to overstate that, but um, that every electronic device that's ever been devised <laughs> either starts off at or eventually uh, gets up, used as. Yeah, you that's know, true. Men and, being men, and you know. It, Humans are like that. You can go back to Roman times. You know? Somebody, John, didn't somebody bring us a Minitel at one point? I think we, I think we got rid of it in the Great Purge of. Pardon me. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, in the Great Purge of uh, 2015, it was, uh, it was lost to. Uh, I hope somebody got it though, because that is a, that is really an important machine, even though nobody in America really ever saw one. We did see this, though, and boy, did Osborne. I drool over this. Yeah. This is an Osborne 1. Much better shape than our Osborne 1 was. You know, Osborne is taught in business schools. As, as a counterexample. <laughs> yes. That's what not to do. <laughs> How not to unveil. Adam Osborne was a, a very quirky uh, Englishman and uh, really quite a character. He's passed since. But uh, this computer his, was his idea to make a portable computer, 20 pounds. By the way, the size of that screen is almost actual size. It's tiny. And, uh, but it was $2,000. And it came with all the software, not only CPM, but WordStar. And uh, what is it, CalcStar? What was the spreadsheet that they had? It came with all the software you need. Uh, that's primarily because Lee Felsenstein really knew what he was doing when he designed this thing. 24 pounds, $2,000, but Adam Osborne made a fatal mistake. Yes, yes. You want to tell us? Um, I think you'll tell it better. <laughs> I was there, I yes, remember. Then you would know. They announced the Osborne 2 long before it was ready and killed sales of the Osborne 1, and the Osborne 2 never came out because the company went bankrupt. But the legacy of some of the software still, it's on. Absolutely. If you look into Word or some of the key Absolutely. commands, it's kind of... I still of, hit Control-KS every time I want to save. It's almost, to me, like the equivalent of English current roads based upon yeah. Roman roads. Yeah. You know, you have yeah. legacy systems live on for Absolutely. much longer than they Absolutely. should. Yeah. Um, except this, was an, this was a really important computer. Look at this. There's a little phone jack so you can connect the modem mm. up uh that was mm. pretty important on the model 100 and other computers that was the only there was no internet but you could at least upload uh and maybe if you were lucky there was a bbs in your neighborhood that you could go to this is 1981 the same time as the ibm pc came up later uh similar machines ended up running uh dos but this was a cpm machine as i remember this was yeah just before dos just dos before. came out yeah Company went bankrupt in 1983. <laughs> Two years later, um, what is? Th oh yes, I think some of you at home will know this, right? You know this, Karsten. You re recognize those symbols? This is an arcane code. What is that? That's how you did graphics on a Commodore 64. Mm. Those are the uh, the little graphics symbols. Or 
It, it looks, it, it so reminds me of hieroglyphics. Yeah, or semaphores. Even. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, You're a naval, I, naval man. You uh, probably know what those flags mean. No. No. No, no idea. No. <laughs> Not a clue. Not a clue. The only one I remember was time to eat. <laughs> that's an important that's an important one. You'll never forget that. Nine a uh, five ninety nine, it came with sixty four K of RAM, the Commodore sixty four, so named. Came out after the IBM PC, but this was for a whole generation, obviously your generation, Karsten. Uh your first computer, right? This was the first computer for so many people. Who are now adults? Yeah, this was, was the uh, that was my computer all through uh, junior high and high school. Yeah, here's the here's the full size uh, version. The Commodore then came out with a cheaper version of this, right? That only had 48. I'm trying to remember what the uh, after the Com the Commodore 64. What did they do after this? There was another one that was really kind of killed the whole. Out of sync is saying, oh yeah, load quote asterisk quote comma eight comma one. Does that load basic? Does that get basic in the RAM? I had the I had the portable version. Oh, the VIC twenty. That no, was no, the no, not that... the VIC twenty. I had the the Commodore sixty four. Came out with a, a portable version with a little five inch screen, oh. very, kind of similar. to Oh, the that's Osborne. cool. That's pretty cool. There's uh, there's the first PC compatible. This mm. this is kind of what Halt and Catch Fire is all about in a kind of fictionalized way. IBM did a silly thing. Maybe that maybe it wasn't so silly. We could be grateful that IBM did it, but they didn't. Uh, they didn't uh, patent or trademark or encumber in any way the the contents of the IBM PC or uh, or even its operating system. And so people were able to. The real trick was to reverse engineer the firmware, the ROM, and companies like Compaq that were the first, then Phoenix later, and others. Uh, were able to clean room reverse engineer it because you couldn't you weren't supposed to look at the code or you'd get in trouble but if you could reverse engineer it you could make an IBM PC compatible and this was really the first bestseller the portable <laughs> 20 pound mm. compact computer wow later uh, later part of the most infamous merger of all time I think oh <laughs> oh, gosh. oh, now we get to my friend. Now, this is an interesting choice you made here, Mark. By the way, we should mention that we're talking to uh, Mark Richards. He's the author of Core Memory, a trip down memory lane, images from the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, uh, a visual survey of vintage computers. A lot of people would have shot the uh, Macintosh from the front. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think that goes back to kind of the nature of when you looked at it sideways it had sort of an animalistic human element yeah. it's almost like it, it seemed alive it has a profile yeah 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 it just it just seemed natural and i don't think in this case that's an accident steve jobs wanted to make a computer that was approachable yeah and it, it really was felt, and that, felt comfortable. it was it yeah. was this was uh this was a landmark in 1984 in personal computing the first one that first personal computer that really didn't feel like a machine mm. now we're not done in memory lane we're going to enter kind of modern times but this is a fascinating one we, we fast forward to 1996 what do you think that is what what is that it's a google rack custom design this was their first production server yep Wow. It was running Intel 8088s. Uh, that had 120K of RAM. K of RAM. Not even a megabyte. An eighth of a megabyte. Running MS-DOS. But the first Google, Google searches were made on these servers. If you look at these, the boards were just... It was all kind of hacked together. Yeah, the hard drives just... Kind yeah. of sitting out there. Yeah, and it kind of, the board's kind of bent a little bit. <laughs> yeah, they're bowed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 uh, there's another story in here that we're going to get to quickly, I mean, uh, soon. And um, I guess that's one thing I want to emphasize is that so much of this history is so 
uh, hacked together. Yeah. It, it's taped together. It's yeah. not beautiful. It's, um, when we get to Pong, I'll, I'll point that out. We, we're coming up on Pong, but no, here... Bushnell's been on this show, too. Here's another image of the, of the Google servers. You can really see how haphazardly that drive is. Uh, it's not in a rack. It's just sitting there. Yeah. But part of that was cost... Uh, and interchangeability. They didn't want to spend a lot of time making anything that was pretty. They wanted to make something that they could slap Work. together, make a lot of them. Yep. And I'll be honest with you, they, they don't look that much different these days, I'm sure, because the idea is uh, this is commodity hardware. Wow. This is this is great that Google donated this to the Computer History Museum. It is indeed. <laughs> what do you think that is? <laughs> You'll probably recognize the interface, but uh, that is a wooden model of the first Palm Pilot. Wow. Yeah, and uh, the pointer at the bottom yeah. is actually a chopstick. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I again, the hack nature of it, you know. It is kind of amazing. Uh, Jeff Hawkins, who was, is, is a genius and a, another man who's been on the show. We did a great interview with Jeff many moons ago in the early days of triangulation um he he kind of hacked this together this was you know he probably did it with a with a he whittled it with a pen knife. Uh, well, I, I think that as you well know and far better than i could is how how well it was put together the software and yes. how um I don't know if you remember at the time, Apple tried to come out with something, and they never got the handwriting. Yeah, the Newton. I have a few yeah. of those in my museum. Yeah. 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 You and know, this, was, this was a revelation. I had used part, uh, pocket computers before. I loved a computer called a Scion 3 Oh, I had one of those. Weren't those great? They had oh. a keyboard. Yes, it was and, very good. And though. I remember talking to the head of Scion at the time, Doctor, I can't remember what his name, I had lunch with him a at the Brit. Palace. British. Yeah, British. Brit. Yeah. yeah. I had lunch with him at the uh, Sheraton uh, Palace. And I said, you know, Doc, if, if you could just synchronize this with your computer so that my calendar that's on my computer would be on this and my phone numbers would be on this, you'd have something. He said, nobody wants that, Leo. Oh, then man. along comes Jeff Hawkins, and the main point of the palm was it had a little cradle. You'd push a button, it'd go, and sink everything over instantly. It, you know, early iPhone in so many ways. Yeah. Without the phone. It's a breakthrough. But, but the software end of it was just it was well brilliant. thought out. And it, the syncing was the key. Jeff told me, though, that you didn't really need that button. Oh. <laughs> that they actually... They, they, you could have just put it in the dock and it was synced. But they thought, you know, people will want control a button. Yeah. And so they actually added a button to make you feel better, not because it had any functional. Oh, so groups. it was a little psychiatry. It was, yeah, there's a lot of psychology that goes into these things. Yeah. Now, this is, tell me about these, because these are, these are really so beautiful. So this is one of those stories that is just so phenomenal. Um, it wasn't totally designed, but it was somewhat designed, and the designer lived because he did this in a concentration camp. What? Yes. Wow. So we've gone back in time a little bit. This is 19, yes. 1940s. This, in the 40s when it was first thought of, and the the head of the concentration camp thought he'd let the guy live because Hitler would reward him when he got it to work. Wow. So... Um, wow. Later on, this device was used all the way up until the late 90s as uh, navigation for small airplanes and also um, uh, for uh, road rallies. Now, it's, a, it's essentially a simple hand computer for addition, subtraction, so multiplication. You'd, you'd set the uh, operands with these little slider switches. You'd turn the crank, and the result would uh, come out up here. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Later wow. editions allowed you to use salt and pepper. <laughs> it looks like a pepper grinder. Yeah, no. Wow. Uh, yeah, Kurt Hirschstark. He was arrested in 43 for being half Jewish and uh, was put in Buchenwald, but continued the design of the Kurta and survived, I guess, as a result. He returned to, uh, he was Austrian, yeah. returned to Vienna after the war, and they made the Kurta computer so if anyone complains about how hard they have to work just wow. remember 
remind them of the design of the kurta. Wow. <laughs> You know, it's it, this is really a beautiful instrument. Now, you must have lit this this shot. No, no, no. I'm giving away all my secrets. Because it's, I mean, just the yeah the highlights on here. It's yeah. really be a beautiful. Just image. Uh, the, at most, I use maybe uh, something a reflector, but no. And it, and and it's black and white, or I mean, it's hard to tell because it's a black it's and white color. device. No, it's a it's, color picture. Yeah, yeah. But it color. looks like a black and white image. Yeah, it's no. Just it's, a it was. I was so privileged. That's, you know, that to, is beautiful. To be close to something as you know beautiful and inspired yeah, story. Yeah, and it, marvelous engineering. Now here's something that I don't think anybody ever saw. It looks like a boomerang. Uh, I think if you're a gamer, you might say, "Well, it could co sort of be a game controller." This is the Apple Jack, part of the Apple gaming machine. Remember the Pippin? Probably not. <laughs> no. They did sell a few, but um, only about 42,000 units, and Steve Jobs killed the Pippin project the minute he got back to yes. Apple. He yes. said, what were you guys thinking? Yeah, he was. A, I think Apple was a little too soon. You know, you got to have <laughs> the right soon. timing. Too soon. And they didn't make it themselves. They, li they merely licensed uh, the idea to Bondi, so that might have been part of the problem, too. I don't want to skip anything. We're looking. Oh. We're looking at everything. There's the pong that you were talking about. Yeah. So the interesting story about this is, if you look at that and look at the back, does that resemble anything? It looks like a television. Set. That's what it is. And they got the TVs <laughs> because from a TV repair shop, and I don't know this for sure, but my guess is the TV was broken and they couldn't fix it. But you could still use it. It would as work a to do this. Yeah. And. And so that's, again, to reiterate my point about being hacked together, you know, Pong came about somewhat because broken TVs. Now, who would have who thought Who would have thunk? That? Yeah. Al Alcorn gets a lot of credit for uh, inventing Pong. I think people think of Nolan Bushnell. And in fact, when Nolan came to visit our studio for triangulation, he drew a picture of Pong on our wall. Right? Remember that? Um but in fact, it's Al Alcorn who Now, this, this is the one that was in the bar down Mountain View. And the bar owner called them up after, a, a, I don't know, some short period of time and said, come get your thing, it's broken. <laughs> and when he went down there, he realized, well, it wasn't broken. It was just full of quarters. <laughs> it was too full. <laughs> Look at this little slot. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just, again, um, happenstance is, is the story well, so Isn't many things, but certainly it. Silicon Valley. Of course, you played the game. It's ping pong. Uh, you have a, a computer ball that's bouncing back and forth. You twist these knobs. They're simple potentiometers to move your paddle and uh, catch the ball before it goes in for a point. And that's the score there. This uh, left is winning 8-3. to three. Uh, I spent a, a miss... I've told this story before. A freshman in college in 1973... Uh, my misspent youth has spent an afternoon drinking white Russians and playing Pong because I couldn't believe this thing is amazing. The first computer game I'd ever seen. Did you make yourself sick with the white Russians? <laughs> no, was, oddly was enough, it, but I was only 16 or 17, so I guess... Was it one of those drinks iron, you can never drink again? <laughs> I had an iron <laughs> stomach. No, but it is interesting. I remember that they were white Russians, so... They made an impression on me one way right. or the other. But do you remember your SAT score? <laughs> <laughs> no, but huh? you remember the white rush. <laughs> huh? Uh, no, but I, I vividly remember doing that because I had never seen a computer game before. And really, in a way, that's what began my career as a, as a tech journalist because mm. I fell in love with these arcade games, spent a lot of time at Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Time Theaters, Nolan's other great invention, uh, playing, you know, dropping quarters into these games, and at one point in the, you know, maybe a few years after this, probably the early 80s, late 70s, I realized, you know, I, I spent so much money on these games, I could buy myself an Atari computer and play them at home. <laughs> that was my, uh, my first computer, Atari 400, then an 800, and the rest is I started writing for computer magazines to support my habit. So, it, you know what? It's a good off. thing that I drank yeah. those white Russians on That's that day right. in 1973. I'm, I'm going to go drink a white Russian <laughs> in your honor. Um, 
But at my age, I'll only get through a half. Of <laughs> That's white where it Russian. all began. Yeah. What is this? I've never seen this, and this is pretty gorgeous. This is uh, essentially a mouse, an early mouse. Yep. But this one has a a really beautiful backstory. It was used to con control the Mars lander. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like something out of Woody Allen's Sleeper. And I... again, the beauty of it is just so... I was just drawn to how the simplicity, the beauty of it. And I'm not sure how well it worked, but... Well, it was a 3D mouse, so you could rotate... And that's why they used it as a lander. It's kind of really almost a joystick. 1991. Probably you've never seen this because it was $800. It wasn't designed for a consumer market. It was designed for... CAD yeah. cam system users yeah. or people landing stuff on Mars. Yeah, no, which was something I used to do. <laughs> yeah, but you know, if you looked at that, the guy who was using it probably thought, man, I'm living in the future now. Yeah, that is no. that is That is straight out of uh, science fiction. Look at that. It's gorgeous. Uh, going back a little bit. Oh, yeah, this is... Uh... The Norberg Differential Analyzer. This thing is as old as I am. I just love the name Norberg. It's the Norberg. <laughs> what the heck is this? It's a table computer. This is so fun. Oh, and who didn't have one of these? The HP01 wrist instrument. It's a calculator. They actually, I think they had a little stylus hidden in there. Didn't uh, they? Yes, they did. Yeah, your your yeah. fingers are too big to tap yeah, on that. Yeah, they did. Oh, man, I remember in eighth grade when some kid came in with that. I was like, whoa, oh, dude. Rich dude, kid. Rich, very rich kid. This is a Hollerith, another name that you should recognize as legendary computing device. This was used in the census. This was, uh, they, uh, somewhere down the line became IBM. Yeah, yep. And so, uh, uh, again, IBM. Um, a government connection to computers. Wow, you know what? We this is we actually have gone through the whole book. <laughs> I'm sorry if uh, I've spoiled I, it for I, you. I, it ends happily. Yeah. <laughs> but I, yeah, you know just, what, Mark? Just, I couldn't uh, stop. I couldn't oh well, stop. thank you. This I, is I, awesome. I awesome. thank you very much. It's called Core Memory. You will want this on your coffee table, uh, and it's great. Get an old timer like me in there looking at it, and you'll see he'll he'll never stop. It's fantastic. A visual survey of vintage computers. It, you can get it on Amazon uh, right now. Uh, you can also go to Mark's website if you'd like to see more images. It's uh, markrichards.com. Mark, I'm so glad you came in to oh, tell well, these thank stories. Thank you for having me. I hope you never get shot at with your pants down again. I... <laughs> If you do, you're doing something wrong. Uh, I'm too old. <laughs> I don't know never if I, too old. I, I don't know if I can pull my pants back up. <laughs> <laughs> you're never too old to get shot at with your pants down. I'm just going to say that. Uh, I'm going to put it out there. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you off air about the last time I got shot. <laughs> was there a jealous boyfriend involved? No. It was as simple as there was a toilet. Hey, you know. And uh, I didn't care about the helicopters attacking because <laughs> I had a toilet. <laughs> thanks to you, Mark. And thanks also to John Alderman. He wrote, as you may remember, from Mondo 2000 and Hot Wired and uh, was yeah. a culture editor. A at, wonderful uh, man. Yeah, really, really great and stuff. And Dag, Dag as well. And Dag, we, you know, he's yeah. the guy who let you in. And so Well, we no, get... it was actually other person, Kirsten. He was coordinating... But I, I also do want to give a shout out to everybody at the Computer History Museum. Over over all these years, they have been nothing but gracious and wonderful and kind to me. We should and, give a plug. And, People and, should go yeah. next time you're in the, yeah. in in the Google vicinity uh, in Mountain View. I I wouldn't be the insecure male at 64 age <laughs> that I am today. Um, no, I stand. Uh, Largely because of their kindness. It's a, it's a great. It was a great uh, creation, and a, it's a great contribution. And it is really well worth seeing if you haven't haven't been there. Next time you're in oh. the Bay Area, yes. thank you, Mark. Really nice to meet you. Thank Wonderful you very images. much for your time. Yeah, core memory. You can get it on Amazon. Silicon Valley Historical Association. I'm glad that, that books like this are being made because oh. this is this is more than my memories. This is history of a, a transformational time. Yeah, in, uh, in our world. Yeah, it's the it's Gutenberg. It is. It's Gutenberg. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Okay. We do triangulation. Normally, we do this. I don't even know anymore. Fridays, right? Yeah, sometimes. 
sometimes Fridays, I'm doing this on a Monday. The reason is we want to get the best people, and sometimes that's when they're available. Uh, of course, it's not just me, Megan Maroney, Jason Howell, uh, and Denise, uh, Jason Howell and Denise Howell. They're not relations, are they? No, no relation. Uh, also host these shows, and uh, I tell you what, every single triangulation is a gem. If you haven't found triangulation or you're just finding it now, there's lots of episodes for you to go back and look at. You can uh, see them at twit.tv slash TRI. Twit.tv is where all of our shows live on. Uh, and you can download audio or video. In this case, I hope you got the video of the show at twit.tv slash TRI. If you subscribe in your favorite podcast application, you'll get it. Whatever day we do it, you'll get it the minutes available. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. I'm trying to get you. Bye-bye.